Good evening everyone. My name is Jen Nolan and I'd like to welcome you to the eighth webinar in Arthritis and Osteoporosis Victoria's 2015 Musculoskeletal Health webinar series. Tonight's webinar will examine the diagnosis, treatment and management of whiplash. Before introducing our presenter for this evening, however, I just have a couple of housekeeping issues to run through. Firstly, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please refer to the chat box on your screen. You can type a message at any time for the organiser at Redback Conferencing. If you are listening via the phone, you will notice a small time delay between the audio and the visual on the screen. This is normal, so don't be concerned. Also, whilst our presenter will answer questions after the completion of her presentation, you can actually type questions for her at any time. Can I suggest that you don't leave your questions to the last minute, as we will aim to finish no later than 8 p.m. <coughs> Australian Eastern Summer Time. I would also be very grateful if all participants could take a moment at the end of the webinar to complete the exit survey. It'll only take you approximately 30 seconds to complete. Our presenter for tonight is Professor Michelle Sterling. Michelle is Professor in the School of Allied Health, Director of the NHMRC Centre of Research Excellence in Road Traffic Injury and Associate Director of the CONROD all at the Menzies Health Institute, Queensland, Griffith University. Michelle has received over $13 million in competitive research funding and has published over 120 scientific papers and book chapters, as well as three books in the areas of whiplash injury and musculoskeletal pain. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Michelle. Thanks very much, Michelle. Thanks very much, Jen. And thanks very much for the invitation to speak to you today about uh, whiplash injury and some of the work we've been doing over the last um, decade almost. So as uh, most of you are probably aware, whiplash is the most um, common, what is classified as a minor road traffic crash injury. Um, but it's, it, the, the uh, repercussions from it are really far from minor, with up to 50% of people um, not fully recovering and 30% having um, moderate to severe ongoing pain and disability. So that's from international data now across um, several countries indicating those, um, those recovery rates. What is emerging also is that people with whiplash often have uh, poor mental health outcomes uh, with the presence of, in some of PTSD, depression and anxiety. Um, in addition to the, the more commonly realised um, factors of pain and disability. At least in Queensland, it incurs greater costs than both spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury from a road traffic crash. So it's of great interest for us, obviously, to be able to reduce costs associated with this condition um, via um, improving health outcomes. Um, what complicates the picture with whiplash, of course, is that it's usually uh, managed within a compensable environment um, and it's precipitated by a traumatic event, which sometimes uh, it will make it different to uh, other musculoskeletal conditions or some other musculoskeletal conditions. Um, so, uh, uh, earlier in the year, in the middle of the year, I was preparing a talk to, to give in Sydney and um, the morning of the talk I got up to, um, to, to finalise it and there was an email from um, a person who had a whiplash injury that you can see here. And I often do receive these emails. So this lady uh, wasn't from a road traffic crash though. She would had an accident at work. And these are the, some of the common um, things that patients tell us uh, with, with, you know, when they contact us. Their frustration of um, not being able to return to work in this case. Um, but the, the point that I've highlighted there is that they still feel that they have no answers. Um, even after changing GPs, and he's uh, told me that I'm sensitive and imagining it all. So unfortunately, even though the knowledge of whiplash has increased, as you'll see as I go through the presentation tonight, and we do have clinical guidelines, the third iteration of clinical guidelines uh, for this condition um, uh, released by the MAA in New South Wales, we're still having patients feeling um, unvalidated and really not getting answers about their condition. Um, just a quick word first of all on uh, whether or not with regards to whiplash there's a pathoanatomical lesion um, and I guess the general consensus now um, in the uh, international arena is that there likely is a lesion uh, but it can't be seen at least in the majority of clinical cases with, clinic, uh, with um, imaging techniques. So evidence from cadaver studies, from 
um, engineering type studies and some clinical studies would indicate that at least initially there, there probably is a lesion but in the majority of people we can't see that and I guess we could debate uh, whether the, the situation for whiplash would improve if we could uh, see, a, see a lesion. Um, but others would argue, well, at this point in time it makes a little difference because it's probably not going to change the overall management. But I won't talk too much about that. It, it's um, one of those uh, controversial sorts of issues. So with some of our research over the last, as I said, the last decade, um, we, the Quebec Task Force um, got, uh, um, it was conducted in uh, 1995 and at that time they indicated there was very little research into the condition and this was needed. So some of the questions we asked ourselves was what is the recovery pathway like? Uh, what processes underlie the condition? Can we predict to those who, who will and might recover? Um, what is current treatment effective? And leading on from that, can we develop better treatments and improve health outcomes and reduce costs? So um, we've done some work looking at recovery pathways or trajectories following the injury. So this is using trajectory-based modelling, which allows the data to speak for itself. So we don't force the data or the participants' data into um, different groupings. The trajectory analysis does that for us. Um, and in this, uh, this is based on the um, next disability index. So this is disability trajectories here. The, we identified three distinct trajectories that you can see. So on this scale, as those who are not familiar with it, zero is no disability, and the maximum score is 100, so um, which is you know the complete disability really. So majority, of, or 45 percent of people, will be predicted to follow this. Uh, trajectory of having initial milder symptoms or milder disability that recover relatively well. Um, another a similar proportion, 39% will have moderate levels of disability that decrease to a certain extent but again plateau out and these people are probably left with moderate disability. And then we have 16% which um, is, is less of course uh, but a significant proportion um, of people that are in a fairly severe way. So they have severe levels of disability that again come down a little bit but they're fairly um, uh, still moderately to severely disabled at 12 months post injury. The thing to notice I think about also about these graphs is that the majority of recovery if it occurs seems to take place in the first two to three months with the then a plateauing out of symptoms after this time. So uh, what we're thinking is that if we really want to improve health outcomes and reduce the numbers of people that develop chronic pain that this two to three months is possibly our window of opportunity and perhaps we could bring uh, some of these more severe trajectories down. This is what our hope would be. As a part of this study we also looked at um, mental health outcomes and in this case it was post-traumatic stress symptoms. So this, uh, these were measured using the post-traumatic stress diagnostic scale but we're just using the symptom subscale so it's not a diagnosis of PTSD, it's just looking at symptom levels. But we get very similar trajectories as you can see. So again around 40% of people here we would say are resilient to the injury, um, that the, the post-traumatic stress symptoms aren't an issue for them. Uh, we have a group here about 43% that we called recovering. Um, so they have a moderate level that are coming down, probably some of these people still having you know, subclinical levels and a similar proportion to the disability trajectories that are, are struggling. So they're having severe symptoms that come down uh, somewhat and then look like they're tracking up again but uh, we're not sure of that because the study finished at, um, at 12 months. So this, this group here and the similar group uh, in, the next, in the disability trajectories are probably the ones that incur a lot of the costs associated with this condition. Um, as you can no doubt see that the uh, trajectories uh, look very similar for both disability and for the mental health outcomes here. And if we do a dual analysis um, on the two, two uh, trajectories from the two outcome measures, uh, we can see that the majority are in sync. So in other words, um, it's highly unlikely for a person to have milder or follow the, the best disability trajectory and the worst post-traumatic stress trajectory and vice versa. So things seem to happen um, in parallel with regards to disability and at least post-traumatic stress symptoms. 
Um, okay. So the, the second aspect of the condition that we've looked at um, to a certain extent is what processes underlie the condition. And I guess this research is driven to a certain extent um, by the, uh, the fact that at the moment uh, it's very, you know, clinically we can't see a pathoanatomical lesion if you like. So as is a lot of um, pain conditions, people have started to look at what processes underlie the condition and can we try to, to treat them and, and improve health outcomes. So various factors have been looked at and these are some of them. Um, and I'll talk about some of them today. With regards to psychological factors, a lot of the work we've done, as you've seen, is on post-traumatic stress type of symptoms. That's not to say they're the only factors involved. And other people have looked at recovery expectations, uh, feelings of perceived injustice associated with the accident and the injury, and pain catastrophizing. They're, they're probably important as well. So um, various, as I said, various processes have been looked at. This is a sort of a diagrammatic view of that. And, and but to remember that these factors are probably linked. I could have drawn arrows between them all, um, but um, you know, it would get a bit messy, look like spaghetti. But I think we've got to remember that things don't, you know, they're not separate substrates. So as you'll see shortly, that stress-related symptoms or factors can be influenced by pain-related factors and vice versa and, and so on. So um, all these things be, become interrelated in some way that uh, we're not 100% sure about as yet. First of all, just looking briefly at motor and muscle dysfunction, and there's been a wealth of research in this area now. Um, and we could find probably hundreds of papers detailing um, patterns of movement and muscle dysfunction in whiplash and in other neck pain conditions. So things such as altered muscle recruitment patterns, so the neck muscles uh, work differently than in people with uh, out neck pain, that this muscle activity is altered with functional tasks such as computer usage, that there's kinesthetic deficits or proprioceptive type of deficits. Um, but the fact is that with these um, motor deficits, they haven't been shown to be a consistent predictor of poor recovery, and, and this has been looked at. The exception to this is, uh, is a loss of neck movement, which is an inconsistent predictor. In other words, some people find it predicts outcome and others don't. So this really isn't to say that we shouldn't address some of these factors, and certainly physiotherapists at the current times do try to address these factors and improve health outcomes. It's just that um, we can't really look to these as um, giving us some indication of whether a person's going to do well or, or not very well. There is one exception to this, and this is just really of interest at this point because we're not really 100% sure of the significance of these findings. But um, some work by a colleague, Jean Elliott, um, a series of studies in the last six years or so, has found that people with uh, chronic whiplash um, have uh, greater amounts of fatty deposits in their neck muscles. So you can see this is the posterior part of the neck here in the spinous process. And these fatty deposits occur um, in, basically in all muscles. There's not one particular muscle group, say a deep or, or superficial muscle group or extensors or flexors that are, that are more affected. This happens also though in other conditions such as arthritis, low back pain, um, shoulder conditions and so forth. So the actual pathophysiology behind it's not clear, may be related to disuse or, or, or different use of muscles. We're, we're not quite sure at the moment. But when we looked at these changes longitudinally, let's put all this up. So we're in a longitudinal study where we followed people from four weeks to six months post-accident and we classified them according to their recovery. So recovered people, um, those with milder disability on the neck disability index and this group here with moderate to severe uh, ongoing disability. You can see that it was really only that group uh, that seemed to develop these fatty muscle deposits. Uh, and this seemed to occur somewhere between four weeks and three months. Jim has done some more work on this and it looks like these changes probably occur earlier. Um, it's just with the, this uh, MRI technology that they can only be seen at four weeks. So this factor perhaps shows uh, some promise is a marker for uh, chronicity, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done on it yet. But it's worth um, it's worthy of interest um, in an area where we don't have many, I guess, 
biomarkers of poor recovery um, and more sort of self-report measures, as you'll see shortly. So one other aspect of processes that underlie the condition that um, had a lot of interest really is that of um, uh, looking at nociceptive processing. And of course, in the last uh, couple of decades, the, the knowledge of uh, processing within the central nervous system has really exploded um, with a whole lot of factors taking place, including you know, plasticity within the central nervous system, also neuroimmune responses and so forth. Um, and the challenge, of course, now is trying to translate a lot of this work which has been done in animals into looking at uh, what happens in, in humans and trying to extrapolate um, these things across so that we can perhaps understand what mechanisms might underlie uh, various pain conditions. We've had a bit of a go at this with uh, whiplash and um, I'll, I'll just report a couple of slides here again. There's a lot of, there's a lot of data out there looking at this now. This is one of the early studies that we looked at uh, pain thresholds in people with whiplash compared to people with idiopathic or non-traumatic neck pain. And using an algometer, so measuring the amount of force required to uh, use the pain threshold response in these people. And we can see compared to controls that in the neck region that both neck pain groups show some hyperalgesia if you like. Uh, but it's only the whiplash group that show more widespread hyperalgesia in the arms and also in their legs. And they also show um, hypersensitivity or hyperalgesia to cold. So what this seems to infer, they, these people of course didn't have an injury in their leg or their arm, is that this hypersensitivity reflects um, augmented central pain processing mechanisms. So whether that's central sensitization or facilitation upwards or loss of descending inhibition um, is what people are looking at. It looks more perhaps like it's somewhat a loss of descending inhibition um, as more data emerges. And so first of all, just making the point here as well, that it does seem to be that different pain mechanisms likely underlie the two neck pain conditions. So whether it's traumatic in the case of whiplash or idiopathic in nature. And this may be one reason why uh, whiplash seems to be more difficult to treat um, and uh, get, get results. And we're certainly starting to get evidence of that from randomized controlled trials or say exercise interventions where patients with idiopathic neck pain seem to respond more favorably. The important factor I think about these uh, nociceptive processing is that it does seem to be a predict poor recovery following the injury. So uh, you can see this here in longitudinal data. This is a pressure pain threshold, um, a composite measure at various sites where the group that end up with moderate to severe disability um, are markedly hyperalgesic compared to the other two groups and control. So this is almost verging on allodynia and similar picture for cold uh, hyperalgesia as well. So these uh, pain responses occur very early and they don't seem to change. So these people, for whatever reason, tip into this hyperexcitable state um, and then they remain unchanged. So again, looking at perhaps the early interventions are going to be so important and trying to pick these people out early so that we can perhaps offer them more effective interventions. So in summary, looking particularly at least at the chronic whiplash, there's two systematic reviews now. We've done one and a group in Belgium have done another and conclude that there's moderate evidence of the presence of central hyperexcitability or central sensitization, if you like, um, in, in chronic whiplash. Um, you'll see shortly, and I've talked a little bit about post-traumatic stress symptoms, and you'll see shortly that they um, also predict outcome. Um, but a study, and some of you are probably familiar with this, it, it was conducted in Victoria um, by Genevieve Grant and colleagues, showing that also stress around the whole claims process um, it, it can predict outcome. And so you can see here that um, a proportion of, <coughs> excuse me, of patients reported stress associated with various aspects of the claim pro claims process and that these factors predicted disability and also a lower quality of life. So uh, sometimes I think when we're looking particularly at PTSD symptoms, um, we ask the patient various questions, as you're aware, 
And I think sometimes they do get the whole thing mixed up when they, whether they're talking about the accident or whether they're talking about their whiplash condition or whether they're talking about stress with the whole uh, process, health and, and claims process. It's something we're trying to tease out at the moment. Interestingly, also just on this, on this uh, area, looking at neurobiological stress uh, systems, and there's a couple of studies out now from the US um, by Sam McLean's group. Um, so he's an emergency physician, emergency doctor, and they've been collecting blood from people coming into emergency departments who've had a whiplash injury. And early evidence is showing that some genetic variants in, in various factors, so the comp gene, and which uh, affects nor, uh, noradrenaline function, and um, FKBP5, which affects cortisol uh, function, have been, are being shown to predict chronic pain following the motor vehicle crash. So this is an interesting area where perhaps some patients are more vulnerable to the effects of the injury or the insult. Um, and these in particular, the more stress-related genes, um, could be uh, something that's an interesting direction that things go in in the future. So perhaps these people are more vulnerable to the whole uh, stress of the accident and the injury. And it could be another reason why their nervous system, the nervous, uh, central nervous system seems to wind up and, and with, with regard to processing those exceptions. So how does this all fit together? We've done a little bit of work trying to disentangle some of these processes. Uh, first of all, um, a study uh, PhD student, uh, Rachel Dunn, and what Rachel did, uh, she's a clinical psychologist, so she got the people with chronic whiplash in and made a diagnosis with clinical, by a clinical interview of whether they had PTSD or not, as you can see here. She got them to recall the, the accident or the, the trauma um, and then at a later date played that back to them and then looked at what happened to the various uh, pain measures and so forth. Those without PTSD, once they, uh, the trauma cue was uh, replayed to them, there was little change in any of these measures. But in those with PTSD, uh, we can see that uh, um, their um, uh, pressure pain threshold in their neck um, got worse. So that they became more sensitive, okay, post trauma cue. Um, and this is quite interesting, I think, and may have relevance for our assessment of patients with whiplash, that if we keep asking them about the accident and how it happened and what direction it was and so forth and so forth, and then we uh, examine them, that perhaps that we could be making them more hypersensitive. So um, this is a, a, a proposal at this stage. Interestingly also, um, their cold pain thresholds increased or became worse because they became more sensitive to cold post trauma cue. But there was little difference in their heat pain threshold. So again, showing this relationship between uh, post-traumatic stress symptoms, if you like, um, the, the event, and how the patient presents in terms of their, their sensory picture. We also looked at um, the reverse. Uh, what happens if you try to treat their, um, post their stress symptoms? What would happen? Um, to their more the physical presentation as well. And in this was a preliminary trial where uh, the whiplash people with the chronic whiplash and PTSD underwent um, trauma focused uh, cognitive behavioural therapy, which is the green group, uh, versus weightless control. So they had uh, 10 weeks of treatment and this was a six month follow up. Um, so we can see in the treatment group that their post-traumatic stress symptoms decreased as you would expect. But interestingly also their disability, and I'll come back to that, and then interestingly also their cold pain thresholds improved. So this is preliminary data and uh, we did, you know, did change their disability, probably just clinically relevant amount, but these people are still fairly disabled. Okay, so we're not saying that all whiplash people need trauma-focused CBT and that's all they need. But it was an interesting aside that if we try to modulate some of these symptoms of stress, we could improve their, their disability levels. And we're looking at that now in a larger trial, trying to combine a trauma-focused CBT and a rehabilitation, physical rehabilitation program at the same time. But it's not all, all stress and just to throw um, a, a bit of a spanner in the works when you start to think you might understand this condition then new data emerges that, 
that um, is intriguing. And this is some work by Ashley Smith, who is a PhD student. And he worked in a clinic in Canada where they do a lot of radio frequency neurotomy for chronic whiplash. We weren't interested in whether that um, intervention is efficacious or not or effective. Um, there's a debate around that, of course. What we wanted to look at is what happened to their clinical presentation following pain relief, uh, which is, reflects um, uh, reducing nociceptive input or anaesthetizing a nociceptive input. So the people underwent uh, radio frequency rhodomy and they had measures taken prior to that and then just after and then I think this is three months after or maybe this is a month after I think actually. And you can see their pain decreased and their disability decreased which we would expect. But also I'll just walk through this slide. Uh, pressure pain threshold in the neck, the median nerve and the leg. They also went up, which is good, so their patients became less hyperalgesic. Cold pain threshold went down, which is also good, so they became less cold hyperalgesic. We also, I'll just move on from the heat one, we also looked at this spinal cord reflex, the nociceptive flexion response, and uh, this improved, so it uh, required more current to elicit a reflex response, so it became less sensitive. So I guess what this is showing is that if we do modulate their nociception coming in from the periphery, we can also modulate some of these sensory presentations. We also change the psychological features as well to a certain extent. So here we have a couple of measures I'll just draw your attention to, the pain catastrophizing scale. Um, so the percent of people above 24, which is sort of a cutoff on that scale, um, decreased. Post-traumatic stress symptoms also decreased, but that, that wasn't statistically significant. So there was a bit of a trend there, though. Um, so I guess what it's saying is that, uh, you know, there may be, in, in a lot of patients, still a peripheral driver to some of these symptoms. In the case of the zygopoff field joint with radiofrequency neurotomy, we may be able to offer the patients an intervention, but a lot of the time we can't um, tell necessarily where the nociception is coming from if it's still ongoing and what we can do about it if, it, if it's other structures. So that's another, as I said before, area of debate, but at least showing that perhaps in some people um, an ongoing peripheral nociceptive source may be contributing to their pain. So uh, the picture of whiplash, um, we're sort of trying, getting a bit better understanding, I guess, of what's going on. But things aren't fitting very well together. We've got a much better understanding, I guess, of what we had 15 years ago. But we're sort of trying to jam the pieces together and there's still a lot that we need to know um, But before I think that uh, we can necessarily improve how the outcomes associated with the condition. So second, next, uh, just looking at whether we can predict those who don't recover. And of course, with there's such a high chronicity rate, this is going to be very important in the clinic. At the moment, the most consistent predictors remain as initial levels of pain intensity, probably about greater than five out of 10 this is in the early stages, within the first couple of weeks, the first three weeks or so. Initial disability levels um, of about uh, probably 30% on the net disability index. Most of these have been phase one studies, in other words, exploratory studies where people are looking for um, various factors that may be associated with poor recovery. We did a similar phase one study early on and then we found a, a predictive set. These were them, initial disability levels, decreased neck movement, cold hyperalgesia and post-traumatic stress symptoms measured on the impact event scale. And then we went on and validated those uh, uh, predictors in um, an independent uh, cohort. Okay, so they held up quite well with regard to their predictive capacity. Um, and a recent uh, summit we had, a re relatively recent summit on whiplash, um, this is what was agreed of factors that are important to consider clinically but also to look more in future research um, and look at possibly interactions and, and, and things between these various factors. So initial pain and disability as I've mentioned, um, I've mentioned cold hyperalgesia as well and PTSD symptoms but as I said earlier tonight, there's other psychological factors, if you like, that have been shown to be associated with poor recovery. And these include recovery expectations, uh, depression, and pain catastrophizing. 
It's also important to be able to predict those who will recover, and this hasn't really been well investigated. It's important for a variety of reasons to be able to provide the person with assurance that they should do quite well. Um, there's also some evidence that uh, too much treatment may be detrimental, um, and uh, Cote in Canada um, has shown that the more more early treatment may um, be in fact be detrimental. So we want to avoid any atrogenesis, of course. Um, and we want to avoid medicalization of the condition. So these patients that look like they'll recover well um, may need more minimal intervention and less, less treatment. So what we've done is gone on to, from our prospective uh, cohort data, we've tried to develop a clinical prediction rule. So the aim of this was for clinicians, obviously, but particularly perhaps for GPs who we need something that quick and easy, doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't take a lot of remembering to do, um, to be able to at least triage and, and, and consider people at, at high risk of not doing well and those at low risk and those that should do well. So this is our plan with this. So we used uh, various uh, cohort data that we had and we included var variables. So we couldn't include things, of course, like recovery expectations, depression, because we hadn't collected that in our initial cohort study. Okay? Um, so we used the variables that we had. And we did various statistical analyses that I won't go into too much into depth. With regards to some of these things, such as the Neck Disability Index and the Post Traumatic Stress Diagnostic Scale, they're questionnaires. And we wanted to see whether we could look at individual items so that we didn't have to get people to use a whole questionnaire. So for the Neck Disability Index, though, none of the items came out as being stronger predictors, so we had to use the whole questionnaire. But with the post-traumatic stress diagnostic scale, we found that the subscale of hyperarousal was the strongest predictor. And these are the factors that are the questions, at least, that have formed part of that subscale. So you can see them there. Trouble falling asleep, feeling irritable, having fits of anger, difficulty concentrating, being overly alert, and so forth. So the patients score that, that in terms of the frequency of these conditions. So this is the factor that, the, sorry, the subscale that came out to be the more uh, strong predictor. So we use that in the, in the clinical prediction rule. So what we found was that people with a net disability index score um, of greater than 40% instead of 100, and a hyperarousal score of greater than six, and they were all over 35, they were predicted to uh, at high risk to develop chronic moderate to severe symptoms or disability. Those with an NDI of less than 30 and age less than 35 were at low risk. And of course, there's always going to be a gray group that don't fit either pathway, and we call these a medium group. So they could either, medium risk group, they could either go this way towards recovery, or perhaps chip into this uh, not so good state of having chronic moderate to severe symptoms. The accuracy statistics on these are quite good for each of the, the high risk and the low risk arms. So the specificity is high, uh, sensitivity is less. But I guess in terms of this condition, we're really trying to target uh, or, or identify these uh, people. Um, and so specificity is probably very good for that. We have similar statistics for the low risk arm as well. So what do we think this means then for, uh, for uh, treatment at the moment? We think, as I said, that those that with low risk probably need minimal treatment. So this might be a couple of sessions of physio. It could be a session with the GP and providing some advice and exercise and various educational resources out there for people with whiplash. But this group probably needs further assessment. The clinical prediction was just a screen. But we would think they would need further assessment of their psychological factors involved, perhaps nociceptive processing with a view, maybe for a better medication or a more effective medication, or perhaps it means other factors that might modulate this nociceptive processing. And in the medium groups group, we would think to monitor and reassess, and hopefully they will go down the green pathway. So at the moment, we're testing this pathway out in a uh, NHMRC partnership grant with MAA and, and MIIC. So we'll see whether if people use the clinical prediction rule um, and make decisions using that rule, A, do, do the health outcomes better, and B, 
how does it uh, change a clinician primary care provider's referral patterns? So finally, just looking at, at treatment, where are we with current treatment for whiplash? And systematic reviews at the, at the, at the time, at the moment, that more or less say the same thing, that there's strongest evidence for activity and exercise, but the effects are modest. So what this means is that if people uh, keep active and, and take some form of exercise, then they'll do better than if they're rested and wear a collar. But it's not a panacea. And there's still, uh, you know, a proportion, a high proportion of people, moderate proportion of people that develop chronic pain. It's not the answer to, to everything. Um, since the systematic reviews, there's been a, a few new trials that I'll just briefly run through with you. Uh, first of all, in the UK, a trial of, um, for acute whiplash, where they looked at a package of physiotherapy, which is about eight sessions, um, versus a single session of physiotherapy. And even though the package was uh, uh, um, gave a modest improvement, from their NHS perspective, it wasn't cost effective. Um, so their conclusions were that a single uh, physiotherapy session um, at this point in time is, is sufficient. We looked at a, a, a trial in acute whiplash early uh, as well, sorry, where we looked at a, an early multidisciplinary approach. So based on some of the findings that we've found looking at processes, we developed this algorithm for uh, intervention. So for example, if the patient had um, a higher levels of pain related disability and marked a hyperalgesia, then they would uh, get uh, adjuvant agents of medication um, that are more than simple analgesia. Um, if they scored more highly on various psychological questionnaires, they may see a psychologist early. And this whole package was then compared to usual care um, in Queensland. <clears throat> so when we look at the results, unfortunately, for this trial, it wasn't that effective. There seemed to be perhaps um, a little bit better uh, outcome uh, for the um, uh, pragmatic multidisciplinary care. The outcome here was the percent of people that recovered. So we defined recovery as scoring less than 8% on the net disability index, but really, um, you know, it, it, it's the bottom line of the trial, of course, is it wasn't effective. There are a couple of issues with this trial. Um, it was quite um, ambitious, as you can see, um, and, uh, and the stratification, I'm not sure now in hindsight, when we look back, it was probably the most optimal. The other thing that we should mention is that the patients um, weren't so keen to, to go to a psychologist early on. They were, they were acutely injured people. Um, and and uh, so the adherence to going to physiotherapy was quite good, but the adherence to going to the psychologist wasn't so good. And they also reported that they didn't like taking the medication. So based on the results of this trial, what we're thinking perhaps is that um, uh, the, the people with acute injury are keen to go to physios, and maybe we need to then upskill the physios in some of the management of perhaps psychological factors or also looking for some of these nociceptive processes as well. Um, and they do that first line treatment in the early stages. Um, and we'll see what happens. So that's the, the trial that we have going at the moment also. Um, it gets a little bit depressing, but I don't think it should be. People say, well, you know, none of the trials are, are, are effective, and you'll see this one shortly as well. But I don't think it's necessarily a, a case of, uh, of um, it's hopeless. I think these trials had to be done. And um, it, again, it's showing what we think all along, that this condition is more complex than what we thought. So in this trial, which is for chronic whiplash this time, um, we tested a 12-week um, knee rehabilitation program. So um, starting with low-load motor relearning exercises and then progressing more to activity and aerobic exercise. And we compared that to one physio session where the physio uh, provided the patient with booklets showed them how to do some exercises, <coughs> and then um, the person, the patient could ring them a couple of times um, afterwards if they needed more advice. So the one, physio the one session was as equally as effective as the 12-week program, as you see here. So this is the out pain outcome and the disability outcome. But you do notice that there is a trend downwards for both groups. That, you know, to some effect, at least for both interventions, it's just that one wasn't more effective than the other. We also built in predictors of uh, 
forward. I'll just go back, sorry, my apologies for that. I put it here. We looked also in this trial where there are any baseline factors that may predict response to treatment. So we had factors such as uh, pain threshold measures, we had some psychological measures, post traumatic stress symptoms, catastrophizing um, the length of symptoms, and so forth. And, and nothing really came out as a, uh, a firm uh, predictor of response. Perhaps post traumatic stress symptoms looked like, uh, you know, showed the most uh, effect. But it was small. Um, so but this is something we're looking at a little bit more, more. And what it would indicate perhaps is that again, those with the more severe psychological presentation aren't going to respond as well um, to what was really, uh, you know, a physical rehabilitation program. And I guess is that so unexpected? So where do we go from here? So um, what it appears is that predominantly physical rehabilitation approach, approaches only have uh, modest effects. But I guess, as I've already mentioned, is this really so unexpected um, in terms of what we're beginning to understand about the complexity of this condition and how and, and, and the environment it's managed in? Um, it may be it, such approaches may be effective for some, and usually, of course, that's the argument when randomised controlled trials don't show an effect that there may be a subgroup that are responding. But at this point, we can't really identify clearly who they are. And maybe those without or severe psychological presentation may uh, respond better, but we need to do some more work to be able to clearly say that. But I think it's important that people uh, obviously need activity and exercise, so people with uh, these sorts of conditions, um, if they don't, um, that potentially adds to the burden of um, inactivity and so forth in the general community. So we need to be able to think of ways to get these people active and, um, and, and undertaking exercise and improve their health outcomes in general. And one of the things that we're thinking may need to happen is that we consider additional interventions to target those at high risk. So these could be things such as targeting nociceptive processes, targeting um, psychological factors as I've mentioned. So uh, risk factors aren't necessarily causal of course. We're aware of that. We're not saying these factors necessarily cause poorer health outcomes. They're associated with them. However, it's probably a good place to start um, in terms of where we, you know, we should move forward with uh, with this condition. So I talked. About, I won't talk about. I've mentioned that slide before. It was really just to outline that if we do um, try and target some of these factors, we are getting, well, I guess, what we call a promising effect. And so we're trying to see if combining that with physical rehabilitation is, is more effective. The other thing we've got to be um, uh, thinking about, I think, is that who should be targeted and avoiding um, any um, detrimental effects to patients. Um, that's where, hopefully, we'd like to see the clinical prediction rule being used so that we can at least now make progress in treating not all with plush the same, but being able to um, target the high and low risk groups, um, which is a start, I guess, and up until now and probably still is, you know, sort of uh, considered all as, as one sort of condition. And how will this be done, I think, is a challenge because most people with these sorts of injuries are managed in primary care. It's a moving target, as you're aware. Um, so it is difficult to try and um, uh, bring everybody up to speed who's involved with the management of these conditions. So that's a challenge where perhaps uh, we can bring things um, online, which we, we've got funding to bring the clinical prediction rules, an online tool um, to be able to make things more accessible um, and be more effective at getting the message out. But that's no mean feat, I don't think, um, being able to change practices in primary care, but we'll see. But I think it's still that we need to understand this condition more, as well as probably other musculoskeletal conditions. There's still obviously, as you can see, a lot that we don't understand. How these all processes fit together? Um, what uh, do, can, can we understand more in depth about nociceptive processing and what's happening there using advanced methodologies that are emerging, you know, fMRI, MRI, and so forth? Um, and then I think perhaps that um, that will then drive into the research where we should go and thinking of new and innovative ways to be able to address some of these processes. So the picture, um, I think, you know, we've made we've made progress. 
um, but there's still a lot to learn. There's still pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that are under the carpet um, and we haven't yet found them. But um, I think we've made some inroads, but as with all musculoskeletal conditions, but back pain, um, other con you know, other musculoskeletal conditions, there's still a lot to, to do. So I just wanted to thank, while I finish up, the rest of the team that's involved at, at Conroy looking into this condition um, and our funders because without them we wouldn't be able to do particularly the larger studies, but RCCs and cohort studies is possible really without getting significant funding to be able to do them. So thanks and um, we can go to questions. Thanks very much Michelle for a very interesting um, presentation, certainly one that certainly goes towards um, you know, beginning to hopefully uh, increase people's understanding, as you say, in the primary health level um, with regards to the management of the condition and so on. We've got a couple of questions that have come through already and I encourage other people to ask their questions now. Um, one question that came through earlier, Michelle, which I believe you have responded to was in relation to whether the, um, per the PTSD symptoms were actually caused by the whiplash or the event um, itself and I think you sort of said the jury's still out on that one. Yeah well originally we thought it was the event, the, the crash, the motor vehicle crash but it's always struck me as a little bit odd um, because a lot of the, you know, a lot of them are very minor car crashes, car you know, accidents um, and so and then when we looked at the, the way the patients were answering the questionnaires we weren't quite sure if they were really understanding the question. So we do say, you know, it's to do with the, the crash, it's not your neck pain, but I think they get it all mixed up. Um, and so we're not quite sure. So we're trying to decipher that. We've got quite a lot of data on those um, those questionnaires now, trying to look at that a bit more closely um, and then and, and see if we can shed a bit more light on it. Because obviously we don't want people to have a diagnosis of PTSD if they don't have it. Um, and it doesn't really help the patient or, you know, what sort of intervention or treatment we give to them. Do you, do you ever see any sort of common comorbidities such as um, fibromyalgia, uh, rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, in our research, we've excluded people um, any with other things, certainly rheumatoid arthritis, and if they've had a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. There is some research from overseas that people with um, who's injured in a road traffic crash and have a minor injury are probably more likely to develop fibromyalgia, but not all of them do. So. Uh, a lot of the people we see certainly don't look like uh, fibromyalgia patients. They may have, you know, they've got decreased pain thresholds in their leg, but they're not necessarily reporting widespread pain. And, and as I said, we would exclude anyone who already had um, rheumatoid arthritis, for certainly. Um, a question regarding um, whether opioids actually increase allodynia. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not I'm not a um, a medico, so um, you know there is evidence that that, that can 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 happen yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's it, it, even in in whiplash where there's the the most um, consistent predictor of poor recovery is initial pain, but there's hardly any RCT with any looking at early medication. Um, so I think that's an area of research whether it's necessarily. Um, you know, opioids or, or other um, uh, anticonvulsants or something, pre gabble and that sort of thing. Um, but there's no no data at all, so we don't really know. Um, in relation to your slides around the effectiveness of the interventions, there's a question with regards to um, if the effects may be modest for pain outcomes, but given there is now central sensitisation, is it more realistic to focus on function, quality of life, reduction of risk for comorbidities? Yeah, well certainly our outcomes, some of the trials we've, most of the trials we've used disability, so not necessarily pain. Um, so again, looking at their disability and, their, and improving their, their function. Um, and we've had uh, secondary outcomes as well in all the trials, which would be psychological questionnaires and so forth. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the person means by look, measuring comorbidities down the track. But no, we don't usually, I said the only trial that the primary outcome was seen was the PROMISE trial and the others have all been um, disability related outcomes. And also a question with regards to nerve meds, um, a, a, nerve, a patient meds effective? We don't know, um, at, at least I'm talking in this case in, in whiplash. So I know that um, uh, there seems to be a bit more of a trend to 
uh, prescribe anticonvulsants, so neuropathic type medication, um, but we don't know if that's effective. We've, we've got a trial under review at the moment to try and look at that, to give them early um, uh, neuropathic medication very early in ED, but uh, we'll see if that gets funded with the NHNRC this year. <laughs> Also, a question um, early on with regards to uh, for female um, uh, females with whiplash, does wearing a bra affect uh, pain levels in any way? I don't think there's any necessarily firm evidence of that, but certainly clinically, uh, with any neck pain, wearing the bra, the bra straps can become uncomfortable. Um, depending on the size of the women's breasts as well, that can alter their posture and, and can affect their neck pain. But I think it's more a clinical judgment, not that. Perhaps I'm not, I'm not aware of specific research in that area. You mentioned um, a few, especially that uh, example of the physiotherapist and, and handing out the information booklet. Is there much research and work being done just about sort of like further education of the person with the whiplash with regards to having a better understanding of, of their condition and how that might um, impact on their sort of um, their, their management and treatment? There's been some trials looking at, it, like I guess, educational interventions in the broad sense. So um, that could be from a video uh, in ED to um, a, a, an exercise booklet, um, and they're very broad and, and hit and miss. And so the evidence again isn't convincing that they have an effect, um, but it hasn't been looked at well, I don't think. And certainly approaches such as explain pain or those more contemporary type of, um, if you like, educational intervention in a broad term hasn't hasn't been effective. But certainly it's something we are looking at as well as trying to um, improve that because as you can see, there's still people uh, in the chronic state that really don't understand their condition and, um, and they don't seem to have got the required information at, at any point. Also, um, in relation to manual type treatment, have you found specific results that may aid in early recovery, such as joint articulation, etc.? Uh, no, the um, evidence for, say, manual therapy isn't strong. There have been a few trials. We haven't done manual therapy on its own in a trial. We tend to stick more to a multimodal approach, which is what's commonly used in practice. Um, with regards to manual therapy, I think there's a couple of studies that shown it may be effective, but um, they weren't necessarily of high quality. So the, the Australian guidelines, the MAA guidelines, which the renewed version was issued this year, indicate that it's not necessarily um, first line treatment, but it could be an additional treatment if, uh, as long as the patient's showing some improvement is their recommendation. Also, just some queries about massage or acupuncture. Uh, not, no, not much evidence for massage. Studies haven't been done on their own. Um, and again, acupuncture, I'd have to check. I don't think, that, certainly in the guidelines, it doesn't feature very strongly. There may have been a couple of studies, but um, the, the recommendation, again, I think is maybe the insufficient evidence. I'd have to check that, sorry. <laughs> That, that's fine. Um, we can't expect you to have everything right <laughs> at the tip of your fingers there, Michelle. Um, so I don't, I think that's the last of the questions coming through. I'll just give people a moment um, to see if there's any further questions. But I think really your, your presentation was so comprehensive about a, a very uh, complex area and certainly hope that this webinar this evening um, goes some way to just assisting people's understanding of the condition and its management. Um, so look, thank you so much, Michelle, for uh, such a, a comprehensive presentation. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who's attended this evening. And just shortly, um, the exit survey would, will come up on your screens just after the webinar concludes. So we would be very grateful if you could give some feedback about this evening's presentation. On that, that note, thanks, Michelle, and thanks thank everyone you. for attending. Thanks for listening. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.